Good morning, Grace Temple. Well, my heart is full today. Uh, 11 countries last year, and two of them twice. So 13 international trips, not bad for an old guy. And uh, thought I was going to slow down this year, but that hasn't quite happened. But you saw, if you looked carefully on that, there was a lot of times that Dwayne Higginson and I were together because we do stuff together. And uh, so thankful for him and you for helping to send us and be so faithful to us through the years. I am very grateful uh, for your participation in what we do. Uh, I'm glad that my wife is here and my mother-in-law, a wonderful mother-in-law who lives with us now for the last several years and so thankful uh, for them being with us today. Just a couple of quick things that I tell you before I bring the word that some of you uh, went to Cuba with us a couple of times uh, over the years, and uh, Pastor Sergio's son, Moses, uh, when we first started, was um, 18, 19 years old, and now he is married and got a wife and a little baby girl named Rosia, and they have escaped from Cuba, and they are living in Brazil. And uh, I feel like the Lord has spoken to me, and so two weeks from now, I'm going to Brazil. It was, um, it was, <laughs> it was not in my plan, um, but I feel like God has uh, spoken to me to go, and Cuba has gone to Brazil, so I'm going to Brazil. And uh, I haven't ever been to Brazil before, and, uh, but we're going to spend a week down there and minister to them and take them some supplies. Uh, Brazil, it turns out, is very cold compared to Cuba. And so we're taking them some, some cold weather clothes and some of that stuff. So we just ask you to pray uh, for that trip particularly. Uh, we're launching a new school in Cuba at Holguin, which is on the east side of uh, the island. And so we just got a whole lot of things that are going on. I'm going to Cuba twice again in the, in the next coming months. I'm doing a pastor's conference in um, Costa Rica where you have helped to build uh, the building in Lamont. And so we're going to be doing a pastor's conference for them. And then I'm going back to Cambodia this year and Kenya this year. And I'm going to be in Uganda this year. And I'm going to be in Mexico two times. So... Uh, we're trying to stay young, but in doing that, I also want to ask you as a church, on May the 1st, I am having my left knee replaced. Uh, it's wore out, uh, three million miles and traveling, and so uh, they're going to give me a new titanium knee in my left knee, and a lot of you have done that, and then in December, I'm going to have my right knee, so I'll have matching knees uh, next year when I come, so... We'd, we just covet your prayers and ask you to uh, pray with us as we recover from May the 1st and, and uh, get ready to travel again after uh, five or six weeks of laying low. So we ask you to do that. T. Lynn, I thought about you when I saw, the, I forgot the slide where I preached in Mexico. It was 106 degrees. I could have used you in a fan. Um, <laughs> she helped me years ago in the Philippines. I thought... That was the hottest place I'd ever been till I got to Mexico. <laughs> oh, but thank you so much for standing with us. Turn in your Bible today to Luke chapter 24. And I want to read um, scriptures um, beginning at verse 13. This is a story that most of us are familiar with. The men on the Emmaus Road. Now behold... Two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. They talked together of all these things which had happened, and so it was, while they conversed in reason, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. And their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another is that you walk and are so sad? And the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, and have you not known the things which happened in these days? And he said, What things? And they said, Well, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. 
Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women, women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, all not the Christ who have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. And beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broken, and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told him about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. So we have a story here of after the resurrection of these men walking on the road and they're having this conversation. It's real life. It's dealing with the things that they had experienced and what they had gone through and what they had seen and what they had tasted. And here it says that they were struggling with the events of it and their hearts were broken because we had hoped that things would work out the way that we thought that they would work out, but they didn't work out the way we expected. <laughs> Have you ever experienced a Murphy's Day, a Murphy's Law Day, when everything that could go wrong did go wrong? Sometimes that day stretched into a week, a month, some a year. <laughs> Days that never seem to end. You know, bumper stickers tell us about real life. One bumper sticker said, it's always darkest just before it goes totally black. Another bumper sticker said, what light? I'm still looking for the tunnel. <laughs> uh, I came across this saying that said, sometimes I think I understand everything. Then I regain consciousness. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about having bad days, and I was reminded of a story that I told many, many years ago, and I decided I would resurrect it today. I thought resurrection was a good word for that, you know, that we would resurrect it during resurrection month. And... Many years ago, I was in Costa Rica, as I've been many, many times, and I was reading the Tico Times, and I read this story that just absolutely amazed me. The story was about a group of Japanese fishermen that were fishing off the coast of Russia many years ago, and their boat sunk. And so when the Coast Guard, the Russian Coast Guard, picked them up, they asked them what had happened. And to a man, every person on the Japanese boat said, a cow fell out of the sky and sunk our boat. And so the Russians thought that they were lying, and so they threw them in jail. And they put it in the newspaper about these Russian, about these Japanese fishermen in jail that said a, boat, a, a, a cow sunk their boat. Well, it turned out that a captain of the Russian airline, Aeroflot, that's what it's called. We call it Aeroflot. It's, I've ridden it before. It's the only plane on the face of the earth that instead of saying, put your seats up and your tray tables up, it says, here's a wrench to make sure that your seat is attached to the floor. <laughs> and a captain said, came to the forefront and said, it is possible that they are telling the truth because on the day in question, I was flying over that part of the ocean and I did have a cow in the cargo hold for a little while. And said the cow got loose from its tether and was running back and forth across the back of the plane and creating problems. And the captain told the steward to go back and get the cow and tie him up again. And the steward came back and said, I'm not going to mess with the cow. The cow is angry. And so the captain said the only thing he knew to do was to push a button and lift the cargo door open 
And when the cow ran out that side, instead of hitting the side, he flew into the clouds. Okay? It's a bad day <laughs> when you're the only ship in the ocean and the only cow that is flying that day flies through your ship. Okay? And of course, I'm one of those that has vivid imagination. I was thinking about the Japanese fishermen seeing the cow coming. I don't think that helped. And of course, then I'm thinking about the cow. Move. No, sorry. But if you think you're having a bad day, Think about that for just a minute. But the truth is, is we all have bad days at times. Things happen that we don't expect. Hopelessness. You know, that's what I was thinking about today. When we give up hope, Cleopas and his friends said we had hoped that he would be the one to deliver us. Things happen that crush our hearts and shatter our dreams. You know, the questions they had that day, were they wrong about Jesus being the Messiah? They had cried, Hosanna, he who comes in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> but then there was the trial, the conviction, the crucifixion. <clears throat> and now they were confused about what was happening, what is taking place. We don't understand everything that's going on. Jesus had hung on a Roman cross. He was shamed, made to be a public spectacle, chastised for our peace, beaten, crushed, whipped. They were confused. You know, some of the saddest words I believe in life begin with a D. Disappointment, doubt, disillusionment, defeat, despair, death. <coughs> We've all experienced these emotions. After the crucifixion, everybody just went back to their own lives. Peter went fishing. Cleopas and his companion <coughs> were walking the seven miles <coughs> to Emmaus. And they were just going back to the world that they had left before. They were planning just to go back and do things that they had always done. Their world had come apart. Again, they said, we had hoped that he was going to be the one who was going to redeem Israel. I want to ask you a question, church, today. You go to church every Sunday, you come and sing the songs. We know all the right words to say. I tell people all the time, we speak Christianese. Yeah. Most people know how to say amen at the right spots. You know, and everybody knows how to say the things that we expect everybody to say. You know, God is good, God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. We say all those things. But what do you do when you've been given a diagnosis and you say there's nothing they can do for me? The cancer has spread too far. My spouse left me for somebody else and loves me more than they love me. My child is doing drugs. They're rebellious. I tried to quit, whatever it is, but sometimes we go through times when I'm not smart enough, I'm not cute enough, I'm not intelligent enough. I don't have this, I don't have that, I don't do, I can't do what you do, I don't have that ability. I can't find a job, I give up. I tried to go to the church, but the church failed me somehow, in my opinion. And so we struggle, we've said these words. And I felt like the word that God wanted me to share with you today is that hopelessness can be very hard to cure. We get into a point where we go down this hole and we feel like we can't get out of it. We don't know how to climb out of the problem. We've become afraid to hope. We've become afraid to trust. What if I hope and it doesn't work out? 1 Corinthians 15, 19 says, this, If we hope in Christ in this life only, <clears throat> we are the most miserable of all men. But now... Christ is risen from the dead. It's because of him that we have hope. It's because of him that we have life. It's because of him that we have purpose. 
Jesus <clears throat> joined Cleopas and his companion as they went down the road. And I find this interesting. They didn't recognize him. <laughs> you know, I find out a lot of times, though we are Christians, sometimes we don't recognize how close he is to us. He's closer than you could imagine. He's walking up and down the aisles of this church. He's walking up and down the seat rows. He's walking near us, but we don't recognize it. We don't look to him. We don't see when he comes to us. Jesus seemed to be clueless about what had just happened in Jerusalem. <laughs> he was playing a part for a moment. He was waiting to see what was really in their hearts. You know, sometimes people say the right things, but there's different things in their hearts. <laughs> he walks with them. He always walks with us on our journeys. He reminded them of God's involvement with his people. He talked to them about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and the Exodus. The Bible says that Cleopas and his friends said their hearts were warmed by the conversation. There's something about being with Jesus that warms your heart, that causes you to start thinking, maybe I could trust again. Maybe there is hope beyond today. Maybe there is something beyond the circumstances that I'm experiencing at the moment. And then I, I thought of something I'd never thought of before. He broke bread. And it says, then they knew their eyes were open and they saw him, but I was thinking that when he broke bread, these were not the hands before the crucifixion. These were the hands after the crucifixion. I want y'all just to think just a minute. He's breaking the bread, and all of a sudden, they see the nail scars in his hands. Oh. It's him. It's Jesus. He's with us. He's no longer back there somewhere. He is <coughs> here with two guys walking down a road obscure. Do you hear me? Not the primary disciples. Not the people that everybody knew their name. This is Cleopas. How would you like to have that name? Come here, Cleopas. <laughs> I just, I was amazed thinking about he could have gone to the big name disciples, but he's with Cleopas and his friend on the way to Emmaus, and he talks to him, and he sits down to break bread with them. And when he started breaking the bread, they saw his hands. And it says, their eyes were opened. Do you understand that their physical eyes had already been opened? They were walking down the road. They could see. But there's several times in the scripture that it talks about our eyes. It's not our physical eyes. It's our spiritual eyes that need to be opened. The problem with us is all we see is the nasty now and now around us rather than seeing Jesus who is still King and Lord of all the earth. He rules and he reigns in every situation. And he died for me. And he died for you. What we celebrated. When we talk about it, it says, do this in remembrance of me. It's for us to remember the price that he paid for our salvation. And he did it so that we could have hope in our life. We are not like other people who have lost all of our hope. We are a people who have hope in the one who lives and lives forevermore. Because he lives, I can live also. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They knew him, and then he was gone. We're not our hearts burning within us. 
while he talked with us on the road and he opened the scriptures to us. Their broken hearts were now burning with passion. They went from a broken heart to a burning heart. <laughs> I felt like the Lord wanted me to tell you today that there's hope for you. I don't know if you're sick in your body, but I want to tell you that by his stripes we are healed. I don't know if you lost your job in the last week or the last month or the last year and you're struggling, but I want to tell you something. There's a hope and a future for your life. The last chapter has not been written yet of your life. There's more in the book. Hallelujah. Some of us thought, yeah, it's all over. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you it's not all over yet. The best is yet to come. That's not a cliche. That's a reality. And I believe that God will make a way where there doesn't seem to be a way. I believe there's something that he can do for us that nobody else can do. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And lean not to our own understanding. Boy, that's tough, isn't it? There's some of you in this room that's got the paralysis of analysis. <laughs> you have analyzed the situation so long that you have squeezed the very life out of it. Stop analyzing. Uh, some of you are punching each other. <laughs> yeah, he's talking to you. <laughs> But I want to tell you something. Your understanding is not going to get the job done. But they started singing the song this morning, He's More Than Able. Felicia. I almost came unglued over there in the chair. I said, thank you, Lord. After all these years, Dwayne, I still like it. But God confirms what he's put in my heart with a song, with a word. With so he says, you're on track, son. Because I'm telling y'all, he's more than able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask or think. Some of you thought you got a big imagination. It ain't big enough. <laughs> he's higher and greater and bigger than all the things that are around us and all of our situation. When things seem to be beyond our ability, we trust in him. I didn't intend to say this, but I'm going to say it because y'all are my family and so I can kind of say most anything. Most of you know that Sharon and I have raised our grandson since he was three, but He's in jail right now and facing some serious things. And we don't know what's going to happen. But I haven't lost hope. Because I believe that it's not just a, a saying. God will make a way where there doesn't seem to be a way. We sang it. He does the impossible. With him, say it with me, all things are possible. Say it one more time. With God, all things are possible. Woo! Well, I felt a little preach on that one. Just when we think we've come to the end of the road, he makes a way. The way opens up. You couldn't see it. You can't. You couldn't see it till you get there. Right? But you have to trust and lean not to your own understanding. Trying to figure it out and analyze it is going to just mess you up. Well, God, it doesn't fit in the box. 
God doesn't work in a box. He made the box. He can take the box out. <laughs> he don't need a box. He works outside of the box all the time. And I want to encourage you today. I felt like the Lord said that there's some people facing hopelessness. But I'm here to tell you, you can have hope. Yeah. And I want to tell you one more thing before I end because the story is important. When they saw him and realized who he was, they immediately went back to Jerusalem. Seven miles. In a hurry, it says. I mean, basically, they did it quickly. And they went back to tell the disciples and then and others. When the Lord has given you hope, when you didn't have hope, the next thing you want to do is tell others. You want to tell everybody what he's done for me. He'll do for you. He's not a respecter of persons. The reason I'm getting on a plane to Brazil with my knee hurting next week is because I want to tell everybody. Moses went to Brazil, didn't have a clue, didn't know anybody in Brazil, just went to Brazil because he could get out of Cuba. Went to a church on Sunday morning, didn't know anybody. He just sent me a video yesterday that he's preaching in that church in Portuguese. It's amazing. They've taken him in. And he wrote me and he said, Brother Ron, he said, you're like a dad to me. He said, the backpack I had, you gave me. He said, the shirts I'm wearing, you gave me. He said, the shoes I have on, you gave me. He said, the computer I had, you gave me. He said, I've told everybody in Brazil about my relationship with you. He said, would you come and tell them what you've told us? Yes, I will. <laughs> yes, I will. I don't know exactly what all is going to be there. I, the way I'm doing what I've done before, I don't exactly have a plan. <laughs> I'm just going. But God has a plan. God wants you to tell everybody what he's done for you. The struggle that we all have sometimes in sharing our faith is, well, I don't know the four spiritual laws, and I don't know the Roman road. To, I, I, I don't know them either. I do know the Roman road to salvation. I learned that early. I'm sorry. But, but the biggest thing that I tell people is that Jesus loved me. He gave his life for me, and he gave me a hope and a future. And because of him, I'm living. And I'm going to keep on living and doing what God has called me to do. And so I want to encourage you to tell others. Everybody you can, everywhere you can, anywhere you can, tell them that he's alive. And that he lives within you. And tell them that they can have hope too. Because it's not just for you. It's not just for me. It's for everybody. Hallelujah. I want you to stand, would you? On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. He's the rock that we stand on. Here's what I'm going to ask you today. I know that I know that I know that God told me to speak this today, that there's some of you that have lost hope. Maybe for your healing, maybe for your family, maybe for your job. You've just lost hope over situations 
And hopelessness in the natural is hard to cure. I've done my fair share of counseling. And in the natural, when somebody says, I've got cancer. And the doctor said, just to go home and die. But in the spirit of God, I can say, God can make a way. He's the healer. I've seen him cure cancer. I've seen him cure diabetes. I've seen him cure the impossible. I've seen, with my own eyes, James, I've seen blind eyes open. I've seen deaf ears open. I've seen it. I was there. So I know that he's able. So I'm going to ask you today, if you're in this room and you're struggling with a lack of hope because of something that's happened or some situation in your life that you're going through, and you feel like you came, you came to the service today, bless your heart, but you came struggling, feeling like there's no hope. And I'm going to ask you right now, without a bunch, we're not going to take a lot more time, but if you came without the hope that you need, I want you to step out from where you're standing, and I want you to come and stand right here for just a moment, and I'm going to pray for you today, and we're going to pray for God to restore hope in your life. Would you come right now, right now in Jesus' name, if you feel that you're, lack of, that you're having a lack of hope in your life about a situation or circumstance, I want you to come. Anybody? Anybody? Lord, you're more than able. You can do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Lord, our trust is in you. Thank you. Anybody else, quickly, join these. I know there's a couple of you. I know I can point you out. I've seen you in the Spirit. This, this, nobody's here to embarrass you. Nobody's here to point a finger at you. This was a time for you to receive. Anybody else? Prayer team, would you come? Would you come and pray with these that are here? Father, I thank you, Lord, today that you give hope. In a moment, God, that we go through a crisis and we seem to have lost our way and situations happen and difficulties happen beyond us. But, Lord, through you we find hope. And in Jesus' name, I ask you, Lord, for hope to be restored. Help us to stand in you, with you, on you, and through you, God, knowing, Lord, that you are more than able. And Lord, today, Lord, that you can accomplish your purpose and plan. I thank you for it, Father. I thank you, Father, I pray. Lord, that you would do what you said you would do, God, because you're not a man that you would lie. And Lord, I pray for this house today. That, Lord, that there would be a, re a, 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 a renewed knowledge, Lord, that you are with us. That you never leave us or forsake us, but you're with us always even to the end of the world. We thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, if you receive the word today, would you let Pastor Ron know that one more time? Let's thank God for him. Well, you can see why uh, I love this man and why God has joined us together in ministry. And I'd like to give you an opportunity to do something. If, if the Lord stirred you today and you'd like to help Ron travel, you see all the places he's going. Cuba, for heaven's sakes, communist Cuba. Uh, we're establishing ministry schools there. Uh, the Lord is doing some tremendous things. And if you'd like to help Pastor Ron, uh, you can do that. You can make an offering to Grace Temple and just make it out for... Uh, note that it's for Ronald Gray Ministries. Make it out of Grace Temple. Every bit of that will go straight to him. You can put it in the offering boxes as you're leaving. You can do so online as well. But I encourage you as God directs you to support our brother and all that he does. We thank you again for being here. And uh, I'd like to close us in prayer. 
by praying for him as he travels. Can we do that? Father, we thank you for this man of God, and we thank you, Father, for the opportunities that you place before him, Father. And we thank you, Lord, that as he travels, that you're going to give grace, uh, Father, physically for him for strength. And, uh, Father, as you continue to open doors for him to father young ministers around the globe, Father, we pray that you would strengthen him as he travels, provide the resources he needs, provide the strength he needs, and continue to fill his mouth with the word of God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your attention today. Go in the peace of God. You're dismissed.